word that go. Okay. Um, let's do this. And do that. Make the TV a little bit easier to see. Okay. Welcome to lecture two here in Introduction to CAD. Um, a couple of brief announcements. So um, first off, I've got the QR code here up on the slide for the attendance. Um, so if you have not yet done so, please uh, scan that uh, with your phone uh, and uh, log in your first and last name. So I've got your attendance um, for the day. I'll leave that up for a little bit while I go through the announcements. Um, so I went ahead and posted the attendance grades to Blackboard um, for uh, uh, yes or Monday's lecture. Um, that feature seemed to work pretty well, so I'm going to go ahead and probably continue to do that. Um, the lecture recording for the last lecture is posted to YouTube. I've said something in uh, the previous uh, uh, lecture, because I have an 11 a.m. and a 12 uh, p.m., and I said I'll probably record the 12 p.m. one. I might call it audible on that, because I have class at 9, and then in here, and then at noon. I noticed my voice starting to go a little bit by the time the, I had my third class. So I might record the first one, just so my voice is a little bit more um, uh, clear. Um, I do have an assignment for you for this week, okay? Um, it's going to be essentially a multiple choice, true, false, uh, matching style assignment on Blackboard. It's gonna open today at 1 p.m. and it's gonna close next Wednesday at 10 a.m. To be frank, I think it would probably take you about 10 minutes to do it. It's not intended to be uh, incredibly work intensive. Um, it's just intended to ensure that you've been paying attention through the lecture. And, and I also just want to make sure that everybody in here is familiar with the, um, uh, with the interface. So much so that I'm allowing you to take the assignment multiple times and it is going to grade the highest one. Again, I'm not really trying to um, uh, uh, make this incredibly challenging. I just want to make sure that everybody's paying attention to the uh, lecture today. Um, the other thing I'll mention is in regards to uh, the survey I did on Monday regarding AutoCAD installation. So about 40% of you had already installed it, which is fantastic. Uh, about 40% of you had not. So I hope if you were one of the ones that marked that you had not, that you have attempted to do so. And don't forget, if you haven't, please try and install it by the end of the week, because um, we are going to be using it next week. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is about 20% of you said that you had tried to install it and you encountered technical issues. So um, if you recall, on uh, Monday I mentioned that I am going to have myself available on Fridays. So if you're still not able to resolve it between now and Friday, don't hesitate to come to that uh, help session and we can try and work that part out. Don't forget also that there is um, our IT uh, specialist, uh, Hussein al Khwazmi, who can help you out. Just make sure that you send an email to him first um, and that you give it a shot before you uh, reach out to him. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Everybody get able to scan the code? Okay. Um, <clears throat> So the purpose of today's lecture is to go, oh, that's uh, last time. Uh, the purpose of today's lecture is to go through the basics of an engineering drawing. And um, I, my uh, initial uh, apologies if this lecture comes across as maybe a little dry, um, but the purpose is to really give you a roadmap for what it is that we're planning on doing throughout the entirety of the semester. Um, there are some seats back here and there's some seats over here. So, okay. Um, the, this whole semester is focused on the generation of engineering drawings. And so I think it stands to reason that we should start out by taking a look at some, looking at what components go into them, and then uh, uh, go through some basics of, of what the goals are and what should be expected uh, in an engineering drawing. And then I also want to talk about just some uh, basics on how to actually draw parts and, and what you should be thinking about when you're uh, preparing drawings. Um, so let's talk about just what goes in an uh, in engineering drawing. Um, and I, I figured the best place to start is just let's just pull a couple up. Okay. So I have here an example of a mechanical engineering drawing. This is a, repre uh, a, a representative drawing that you would find in a mechanical engineering context. Okay. So I have here a drawing of a flange housing part uh, 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 for a given installation. Now, um, a couple things that I want to point out. Um, this drawing is essentially, if you look at it, there are a number of different views of the same part. Okay, So we're looking at the same part a number of different ways. We've got looking at it this way and looking at it this way. We even have uh, some section views where we're looking sort of at the inside of it. 
If you look also in the top right, you can see sort of an attempt to render the, uh, the, the image in 3D. Uh, we call that a pictorial uh, uh, view. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, the different ways of doing that, advantages of one versus the other, um, and, uh, uh, and what have you. Now this is a mechanical engineering drawing. This is a civil engineering drawing. Here we have an overhead view of a road construction project. Um, there are a couple of things worth mentioning. First off, there are a lot of common elements in both drawings. Like These drawings are more alike than they are different uh, when we actually start hammering into what actually uh, uh, is important uh, in, a, in an engineering schematic. But there are some things that are included here that you wouldn't find on a mechanical drawing. As an example, a north arrow. You wouldn't need a north arrow for the uh, plans for a machine part. It wouldn't make any sense. Uh, but in a road construction project or any project that uh, is referenced on the earth, obviously that makes sense. Um, building plans, road plans, things like that. Um, there are also various uh, line types. And I know, again, that might seem kind of dry, but we have sort of a, a very standard way of referencing things uh, in engineering drawings. And I'm going to tr try today to talk about what's common among all drawings. And then later on, we'll get into the specifics of what's different between the disciplines. And again, as I mentioned for you biomedical engineers, what I say for mechanical engineers is really going to apply to you too, because the methods and goals for producing a gear is going to be the same for some biomechanical part or, or what have you. Um, looking at both drawings, um, they contain some common features. And so let's try and isolate what's common and what goes into uh, an engineering drawing. So first off, it might sound silly, but every drawing has a border around the page. Commonly around a quarter of an inch or half an inch away from the, uh, uh, the edge of the sheet, just to clearly identify where the bounds uh, of the schematic are. Um, there is a title block, um, and we'll, each one of these, we're going to go into these uh, in, in some more detail. There is a title block, which contains some very key information about the drawing. Um, the drawing itself is of some parts or some components, so whether it, in the mechanical engineering context, looking at a part in a given assembly, or in a civil engineering context, a, a certain section of a project, the drawing has a given theme, a certain, a certain goal that we're trying to achieve. Um, there are different lines, different, uh, uh, different line types, and what have you, uh, and we'll sort of indirectly cover a lot of that in this lecture. Uh, dimensions. Um, there, no engineering drawing would make sense without some understanding of dimensions. Um, and this is probably the one area where I think civil engineering and mechanical engineering drawings truly differ in how they handle dimensions uh, and whatnot. Um, we see a lot of annotations, a lot of notes, a lot of text, uh, and also some information uh, regarding scale. Okay? And like I said, for each of these, we're going to go into these uh, in a little bit of uh, detail. Um, First off, let's just talk about the paper, the actual sheets that you print on. And again, I know I understand that this might seem a little bit dry, but I mention a lot of this terminology because when we get to using AutoCAD and we start wanting to uh, export our drawings to some sort of printed medium, uh, I want you to be familiar with the notation that is used inside, uh, inside AutoCAD. Um, so um, one of the things I'll mention is that there are different, um, there are actually different standards for sheets of paper uh, and what have you inside um, uh, 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 you know, in, in the industry. Um, if you uh, go internationally uh, in, in international settings, you'll find paper that's sort of designated by like A0, A1, A2, A3. Like a very common paper size internationally is A4. Um, A4 has a little bit of a different size than, um, than letter, but it's, it's the closest international um, uh, equivalent to A4 is a letter. Now, letter paper is what you would find in a copy machine, like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. I think that's something everybody is familiar with, right? Eight and a half by 11. Um, that uh, sheet of paper follows uh, ANSI standards, and so we have a name for that. We call that ANSI uh, size A. Uh, the reason I mention that is because when you start uh, plotting uh, in AutoCAD, uh, when you start looking for paper sizes, you might, I just want to print to an 8.5 by 11. Well, you'll see reference to ANSI letter uh, uh, size A or ANSI size B, and so I want you to be familiar with that. Um, I have here a little graphic that kind of illustrates the relationship between ANSI paper sizes and architectural paper sizes. 
like a very common paper size for engineering drawings is an 11 by 17. And according to AMSI, that's an AMSI B, okay? Um, where they get the, the letters, where they get the designations is so if you have two letter sheets of paper, an eight and a half by 11 and an eight and a half by 11, and you stick them next to one another, that's an 11 by 17. Does that make sense? So it takes two A's to make a B. It takes two B's to make a C. It takes two C's to make a D. It takes, you know, and so on and so forth, okay? So um, if you're ever trying to understand the paper sizes used in engineering drawings, that's kind of the, the notation there. So two A's make a B, two B's make a C, two C's make a D, etc. cetera. Um, ANSI paper is uh, pretty much, I would say, is fairly standard for civil uh, and mechanical engineering drawings. There is a slightly different standard for architectural drawings. Um, so an, if an, an ANSI A is eight and a half by 11, an, a, an architectural A is a nine by 12, slightly bigger, okay? So I mention that because when you start going into um, AutoCAD, the plot, you're gonna see a list of papers, ANSIA, NSIB, Arch A, Arch B, Arch and so on and so forth. But I just want you to have a general idea of what these uh, paper sizes uh, entail. So if you wanted to print to an eight and a half by 11, that's ANSI letter or size A. Um, let's talk about the title block. So I don't care what um, uh, uh, type of drawing that you generate, uh, they're always gonna have some degree of a title block, okay? So a title block, is intended, um, what it does is it conveys basic information about the drawing in a single um, uh, location. And title blocks will tend to contain both general information and specific information. General means like data about the entire company or the entire project. So it is not uncommon for a single engineering project to have tens or maybe even hundreds of individual drawings. So the general information might be the company that produced it, their company name, company address, et cetera. If they're subcontracting to a different company, who are they subcontracting to? Maybe some information about the project, but then it's also gonna contain information about that sheet. So for example, sheet 12 is the drawing that contains this. Um, it's gonna contain the scale, um, the notes and specifications, who designed it, who drafted it, so on and so forth, okay? So a lot of that, all that information is gonna be contained in a single uh, area called uh, the title block. I've got two examples of a title block here on the screen. Um, you find different ways uh, of arranging it. Some of them do sort of a, a bunch of information on the bottom right of the uh, page or the bottom of the page. Some of them cover it over here on the, on the right side of the page. Um, it is, a, a couple things I'll mention about this. Number one, it is sometimes uh, 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 conventional inside the title block to include a revision table. It is very common that when you're producing parts or components or sections of a project that you have a drawing and then it gets revised, right? So um, you'll have revision two, revision three, revision four. So there'll be a, a table that says, here are the um, revisions and here's generally what was done between revision one and revision two, just a means of tracking what's the most uh, up-to-date uh, uh, item. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that uh, title blocks will tend to um, discretize between who designed the part or component and who drew the part and component. Because a lot of times, those are different people, right? An engineer might be the person who designed the gear and then a, um, somebody else drafted the gear. Okay, sometimes they're the same. Sometimes, sometimes it's the same, sometimes it's different. Um, but you will see, for example, if you look at the, um, uh, the title block on the left, you will see a, a section on the left that says drawn by, and it lists their initials. Uh, designed by, lists their initials, or approved, lists their initials. Some, this one says drawn, checked, and approved. Um, one thing that is also uh, conventional uh, is that um, there is a space that lists both who prepared the drawings and then who checked the drawings, and those are usually two different people. It is, it, um, one of the industry standards in engineering is that any design or drawing must be able to withstand the scrutiny of independent review. So you produce a drawing, you then surrender it to somebody to review and provide comments and feedback, uh, et cetera, okay? Um, there is another, um, uh, actually I'm curious, I'm gonna ask, is there something about the text on these title blocks that anybody's noticing? I know it might seem really dry, but there's something about the way the text is formatted on these. Yes? They're all caps. They're all caps, right? 
Everything in the title block, for the most part, is all caps, okay? And that is industry standard in engineering drawings that the text is all caps. Very rarely will you see text on engineering drawings in lowercase. You do see it sometimes, like for example, you can see in the title block where they have some names and addresses and things like that. And if you have a lot of text, like a lot of notes and specifications, you might see some lowercase. But more often than not, the text in engineering drawings is in all caps. Okay? So for all the drawings that we produce in this class, all caps is going to be what we do unless otherwise noted. So. Okay. Scale. Let's talk about scale. Okay? So it is not uncommon to... Uh, well, it's more common than not um, to produce engineering drawings that are much bigger than the sheet of paper that they are going on. The drawings of the road, uh, the civil engineering project that I uh, just uh, illustrated, I mean, that was printed on an 11 by 17 sheet of paper, and that road was hundreds of feet long. So I'm certainly not going to uh, expect that you find uh, a sheet of paper that's hundreds of feet long to print that project on, right? That's silly, right? Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to scale that, okay? So drawing scale is either the reduction or the enlargement of a given part uh, relative to the size of the real part. So whether it's in a civil engineering context and we are shrinking the drawing in order to fit on the sheet of paper, or it's a, let's say, a mechanical engineering project, let's say biomedical, let's say you're drawing something that's a really small, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, biomechanical enzyme, something really small, but the drawing, you want to expand the detail, so you're magnifying it so that all the details of that part and component can be relatively well understood on the drawing, so you're scaling it up. Either one could be done. Scaling down is more common, but I, I just mentioned it as a possibility. But drawing scale is the reduction or enlargement of the, the, um, the object relative to the, to the size of the real object. And so the idea is that all of those uh, uh, scalings are done sort of like one to one. So for example, uh, on a, uh, uh, the road project, for example, if you're scaling it down on, let's say, a one to 10 scale, that means every single line, every single component is scaled down up to the same factor. So if you look at, I've got here what sort of looks like a Tetris piece. So if you look at the left image, the left image is just one to one, that whatever's on the page exactly matches um, uh, 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 the, the real size of the object. If we're using like a one to two scale, well that means every single dimension, every single line is shrunk down to the same component. So that if you look at the part once it's shrunk down, it's all the same relative uh, uh, size and whatnot. Same thing if you wanted to increase uh, scale. Okay, does that make sense, that idea? And that, that is gonna be something that we talk about later when we start taking something like a floor plan or something like a, a, a large component and we're gonna have to figure out the scale that makes sense uh, for the drawing. So but we'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Okay, dimensioning, okay? No engineering drawing would be complete without information regarding dimensions, okay? If I produce a design and say, here's a plate with a hole in it, that doesn't really help. You need information about the size of that plate, the thickness of that plate. Where do the holes go? How do I measure where the holes go rel relative to the other dimensions of the plate? What's the diameter of the hole? And, and so on and so forth. Um, so for example, if we look here, at, I've got a schematic here on the screen. It's not just you know some lines with some holes in it. You can see very specific information about the distance between you know, this hole and this one, the diameter of this hole. You can see this, you know, these sort of text and arrow um, uh, 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 leaders indicating where the dimensions are, what the dimensions are, uh, what the scale is, et cetera. Um, it is incredibly important that whenever you're dimensioning um, a, uh, a component that the dimensions are both unambiguous and complete, okay? Um, and, and without that, you couldn't fabricate the piece, okay? And just to sort of like make the point, um, I, I just sort of thought of this little, uh, so sort of a quick experiment to sort of make the point. So let's say that I had, um, let's consider a rectangular plate with a hole in it, and let's say that the hole is not centered, okay? So for example, let's just sort of consider this plate And let's say there's a hole in it 
about right here. I'm just making this up just for the sake of discussion. Now I'm curious how many pieces of information, how many individual dimensions are necessary to fully define the fabrication, the three-dimensional geometry of this object. And I'm thinking the minimum, okay? Well, let me walk you through that. So first off, I think we at least need two dimensions to define the size of the original plate. So let's just say 10 inches. And let's, I'm just making these up. Six inches. Right? So without those pieces of information, I would not understand um, the size of the plate, right? But now that I have that, I, I now have everything that I need in terms of the length and width of the plate. Okay? Um, what else? Um, how about where that hole is? How about where the hole goes? So maybe what I'll do is I'll say, okay, here's the center of the hole. Let's just say here's the center of the hole. Maybe what I'll do is I'll say from this corner, this dimension is three inches. And let's just say this dimension here. Yeah, let's, let's do this. Make that a little neater. Let's just say this is two inches. Okay. Now, one thing I'll point out about this is that, so if you look at this, I, I've dimensioned this a certain way such that I've referenced the dimensions from the top left corner. Just curious, do I need to include this dimension right here? Do I need to actually put this dimension? No, I do not, okay? I do not need to do that because um, it would not provide any independent, unique information. Because if I know that from the top to the center of the hole is three, I know that from the center of the hole to the bottom is seven, right? It would be superfluous information. In fact, it is standard to not do that, okay? The, when you dimension, you want your dimensions to be complete and unambiguous, but you want to provide the minimal amount of dimensions, the minimal amount of detail, because one, more dimensions, more annotations, more notes leaves more room for error, and more dimensions, more annotations, more notes means more to review, okay? So you want to make the, the drawings as concise and easy to understand as possible. Now, I have provided four pieces of information uh, on this uh, drawing. I propose that in order to fully describe the part, I need two more. Can anybody tell me what one of those is? Radius of the circle. The radius of the circle. Okay, that's a really good point. Okay, so your answer, that is 100% correct, that we need to understand the circle. Now, this is a side note, but uh, whenever you're specking out holes, you typically express in diameters, not circles, or not radii. Is, why do you think we do that? I'm curious, does anybody have an idea? Why would we spec holes in diameters, not, not radius? The diameter is all circles. Well, true, but, but the radius and the diameter would both say the same thing. Why do we choose diameters over radii when we're putting dimensions on? There's a reason, yes. If you drill in the, the drill bits and the diameter. That's exactly right. When you, go to, when you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or Granger or whatever and get some drill bits, drill bits are out in diameters, they're not in radii. Now, you are right that it's the same piece of information, but for what's standard holes typically are in diameters but on a side note if you're using fillets or you're rounding edges you typically do that in radii so I, I just mentioned the, the difference but you are I mean in terms of the piece of information you are 100% correct and so typically what we'll do is we'll say something like uh, diameter 1.5 so if you ever see like that circle with a line through it, it, it it's indicating the diameter okay now, in order to fully describe this part, though, there is one more piece of information that we need. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah. The thickness. Exactly right. The thickness of the plate, right? We didn't mention what the thickness of the plate is, right? So the thickness of the plate in this case, I'll just make it up. We can say 0 0.25 thickness. Right? And now that's fully um, uh, dimensioned. Notice I wrote that in all caps. Again, that's standard uh, on engineering drawings. Okay. Does that make sense? But later on, when we start getting into dimensions, like I'm not gonna tell you how many dimensions to include. I, I might say, here's a part dimension, and you gotta think about what's the most efficient way to do it. When we get to that lecture, we'll have some more detailed discussion on how you should format them, how they should be arranged, and so on and so forth. So right now, it's just sort of high level. Okay. 
All right, annotations, okay? Um, like I said, uh, so, so the, when I use the term annotation, um, annotations mean just text, okay? You will find engineering drawings that just have text on it. So, note, so text could be things like any notes that contain supplemental information on the drawing, things like codes and specifications. It's not that uncommon to say this plastic in this part conforms to ASTM such and such material standard. So that whoever's manufacturing it understands that the materials that they use need to conform to a certain specification. Um, any instructions for the fabrication. You cannot drill this hole. You need to use a CNC or subpunch. You need to, um, the uh, uh, surface roughness needs to achieve a certain specification and so on and so forth. So you include text you know, to supplement that. Um, any references, did you reference a code? Did you reference uh, another drawing? So on and so forth. And again, the standard convention is to express text in all caps. If you install AutoCAD, AutoCAD came with some fonts, okay? If you actually open up Microsoft Word, you'll see some new fonts on your list. These are a couple of fonts that I, in my practice, I, I've seen are really, really common. So um, one of them's Roman S. Roman S is probably like the most ubiquitous font I've seen on engineering drawings. We'll probably use that for all of our uh, drawings in the class. Um, the other is City Blueprint. I've seen City Blueprint a lot on, um, well, blueprints, like architectural drawings, and things like that. Uh, so I just mentioned that that's kind of the fonts and whatnot that we'll use in here. Um, some additional items that you might see on engineering drawings, one of them is a bill of materials. So for example, if you have a given assembly or a given component, like let, so for example, in structural drawings and buildings, you might see, okay, I need this many bolts, I need this many you know, W10 by 49s, I need this many studs, and so on and so forth. Just a list of the parts and components. So Here's a component, here's how many of them they need. Um, a north arrow, this is more on the civil engineering side of things, but one thing worth mentioning, north arrows do not have to be drawn straight up. In fact, more, more often than not, they're not. Um, typically what you will do is rotate the drawing such that it fits inside the page as aesthetically as possible. And so if the north arrow is off a little bit, that's okay, as long as you're indicating which direction north is. Um, Scale blocks are also uh, typically uh, common. Scale blocks can either be an actual block like that, or they can just be information inside the tile block, like one inch equals 10 feet. Um, you can also have different horizontal and vertical scales, and I'll show you an example of that uh, later. Uh, another thing that you might find is a professional engineer's uh, seal. I found an engineer to put one on there. He's a jerk. Um, just kidding, that's my seal. Um, the, uh, so uh, if you ever have a drawing that, um, uh, needs the approval of a professional engineer. It is common that you, you, know, you will need their seal on that before it gets uh, uh, um, distributed for manufacturing and whatnot. And so their seal and their signature and whatnot will be provided. So I put my seal on there just so you can kind of see what one uh, looks like. Okay, any questions? Okay, um, so uh, really the star of the show in an engineering drawing is the parts, right? And um, the, the main challenge or the main thing that you have to consider is we build things in 3D. Like I don't, doesn't matter what context you're talking about, we build things in three dimensions. And a sheet of paper does not represent things in 3D, it represents things in 2D. So you need to think about representing parts from 3D, uh, 3D parts in a 2D environment. And so we need to talk about projections and views and things like that, okay? So just to kind of make the point of what I'm talking about here, um, let's take this house, okay? So I have here a house, um, and in, uh, uh, in general, if I have a house, if I'm talking about orthographic, um, there are six different ways I could look at that house. I could look at it from the front, I could look at it from the back, I could look at it from the left side, the right side, the top, and I could look at it from the bottom. Now for this particular object, each one of those views gives some unique information. So for example, from the top, I can see all the dimension details of the roof, and from the bottom, I can see the uh, framing plan of the floor, right? The left side and the right side of the house look a little different, um, and front and back look a little different. So every view provides unique information. So if I was drawing a, like this drawing, I might need to use all six views because they're all different, okay? Um, any object can be viewed from six mutually perpendicular directions. I'm gonna use this terminology, 
the front, the bottom, left side, right side, rear, and top. I'm going to try and use that um, pretty, um, uh, uh, pretty straightforwardly. Now, one thing I'll say is um, you can represent an object with six views. One of the questions is, should you represent an object with all six views? And we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, uh, that's really sort of the main point of what we're talking about. Um, now, um, what we typically do when we, um, when we create a drawing is we use sort of like an orthogra orthographic projection. And an orthographic projection basically means that we're drawing the objects on a one-to-one -one scale. So for example, if this dimension here, so for example, that hole. If that hole diameter is one inch, then when we draw the uh, part from that front view, we draw a one inch diameter circle. So all the dimensions are one to one. We're not taking uh, engineering drawings and when we draw the section views, we're not using like an artist's perspective. Like you know how in perspective drawings, like if you're drawing something, you pick that point and all the rays all go to that common point. We don't do that in engineering drawings because then it would be difficult to scale um, uh, parts, you know, for, for, for accuracy. So we just, all the dimensions and distances are one to one. Um, so uh, if we look at an orthograph, a standard orthographic projection, so a standard orthographic projection would have a front view, a top view, and a side view, okay? And if we go back a couple slides, that front view, top view, and uh, side view, all those views are, are basically referenced from the front. So if you can decide what the front is, everything else can sort of uh, 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 be referenced from that. So really the front is the, the main question. Um, to help understand the arrangement of these views uh, about how you arrange them and how you would organize them on a drawing, one of the ways that you can think about this is sort of think about this from the perspective of a glass box. So imagine that you have a part that you're trying to draw in two or three dimensions, uh, or if you're trying to draw, let's say you're trying to draw all six sides, we would put that part, let's say, in a glass box, and then what we would do is with each pane, we would look in the glass box, and we would sort of one-to-one -one trace what we were seeing. Now, one thing, I, I'm going to go back a couple slides because I didn't, I didn't really highlight this because I'm going to talk about this here in a bit. But if we look here, one of the things that you'll notice is that dependent upon the view, some lines may be hidden. So for example, if you have sort of like an L-shaped part and you look at one of the sides, one of those edges might be hidden. And so we draw that with a dashed line. I'll, I'll talk more about that later. But the way that we typically organize that on a drawing is we'll take these and we'll unfold the box as it were. And we unfold the box and now we can see where we put the front view, where we put the left side, where we put the right side, where we put the top and bottom. Etc. Okay. Now, um, I have here this object, and I know a lot of you have this pulled up on your laptop, so for those of you that don't have it pulled up, it might be easier. Um, I have this object, and I have this object shown with all six views. Can somebody tell me what they're seeing when they look at the left side and the right side? Well, can, you, can anybody comment on the left side and the right side in terms of the information you're providing? What do you notice about the left side and the right side? Does that one smell like working? I'm not talking. No, I'm not. I'm talking about the information that's provided. What's what information is provided to you on the left side? What information is provided to you on the right? Side? Well, the dotted lines. Let me ask it more generally. Are they the same? No. Well, they're well. What I'm saying is they're mirrors. But I'm what I'm getting at is here. Let me let me ask it this way. Um, let's say this dimension right here is 8 inches. Let's just say that, right? That's going to be the same over here, right? I'm going to get the same dimensions, the same information from the left side and the right side. My question to you as engineers, is there any additional information you are getting from, like if we eliminated one of them? Would you still fully understand the, the definition of the part? I'm saying yes. I'm saying that wasting time drawing all six sides is unnecessary. Okay? It also causes more to review and potential for error. So I'm saying we can eliminate some of those views and still fully describe the part. Okay? 
That's actually one of the big questions to ask in an engineering context is how many views is enough, okay? In general, when you're preparing an engineering drawing, you want to accurately represent the part with as little, a few views as possible, not as many, okay? Because the more stuff that you provide means more to review, more clutter, more difficult to interpret. Uh, you can have additional views with more contradictory information. Instead, no, 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 as few views as possible. For example, I have here this drawing of a brass a shim. This is similar to the schematic we just pulled up here a second ago. There is everything I need to fully describe that part. All the dimensions, the thickness of the part, what it's made of, with one drawing, one schematic. And really only a few annotations. There's not much to review there. If everything there's good, boom, move on. Okay? Creating side views and front views and top views and left views and right views would, would not add anything. Right? So this is what I was meaning when I was saying how many views is enough, as few views as possible. Um, Whenever you're looking at a part, you want to try and eliminate unnecessary views. So some rules of thumb is that if we go back to that part before, the right side and the left side, they, they pretty much say the same thing. So if they describe the object equally well and you have to choose one, standard is to choose the right side. And with top and bottom, the standard is to choose the top. So if they, if the left side and the right side gave you equal information, choose the right. If the top and bottom gave you equal information, choose the top, okay? Um, this object, I could fully describe with far less than six views, okay? A standard, uh, a standard set of views um, in engineering drawing is an orthographic set of views. This is for you mechanical engineers. So the idea is we do a front, top, and right view and so the idea is that we, we, again, using that sort of like glass box approach, the idea is we sort of draw out, you know, essentially what I'm calling these folding lines. And so imagine if you unfolded the glass box, what would you see from front to top? What would you see from front to right? And so you don't actually put those folding lines in the final schematic, but the idea is this is kind of uh, uh, what you see. But does that idea kind of make sense? That concept kind of make sense? Again. You, you want to reduce the amount of potential error as much as possible, okay? Now, for you mechanical engineers, one of the things, and again, for you biomedicals as well, one of the things that you're going to have to decide is what is the front? Like, what, what is the front? Like, if I give you a part and I say draw it, what's the front? Like, nobody's going to tell you, you know, what's the front. You, as the engineer, need to decide that such that it, um, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Well, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm getting ready to say. You're 100% you're, you're, you're you're right. That, that's get, what I'm getting ready to say. I, what I'm using is I'm, I'm going to use the example of a vehicle to kind of make sense. So if you all are thinking in terms of a car, the front of the car is like where the headlights are, right? But that's not what you should use for the front from an engineering schematic standpoint. You typically want to choose the front view such that it has the highest number of normal surfaces. As you said, the longest, biggest side, that's 100% right. You also typically want to show the object in its usual operating position. So for example, the image on the top left and the image on the bottom right are both sort of of the front of the car, but nobody really thinks of a car up and down, you know, with the wheels to the side. That doesn't really make sense, you know, unless it's like a James Bond movie or something. Um, instead, uh, we just want uh, the car, you know, in its normal position. So I just say that, like, there's a difference between the front, you know, of a car, like where the headlights are, and where you would uh, orient the front uh, uh, from an engineering schematic standpoint. Um, it is not uncommon also to uh, um, draw a part and, and only draw a portion of it. So, for example, if you have a rotationally symmetric part, such as a gear that's circular, right? Let's say you have a gear that has some holes in it, and those holes are rotationally symmetric. You don't actually need to draw the whole circle. You can only, you can draw a portion of it and say, whatever's over here is symmetric about the center line. So you only need to draw half of it, okay? Um, so you can draw half of it and then use what's called a break line to basically say, okay, I don't need to draw the rest of it. So like, for example, um, I'll pull this up here. Um, 
So, like, if you had a part, I'll, I'll just make something up. You could have a part, and you could say, here's some holes, here's some holes, holes, holes. And sometimes you'll see break lines sort of just, like, drawn like that. Like, a lot of people do that if they do it by hand. Another way you'll see a break line is, you know, you see the part, hole, 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 hole. And you'll see this and sort of like this Z looking shape. And that's called a break line. AutoCAD, if you tell AutoCAD to draw a break line, it draws it like that. So I just wanted to show, if you ever see that, that's what that looks like. So um, again, some of these line types for like what a break line looks like, what a section line looks like, et cetera, we use a pretty conventional standard across all engineering drawings. So again, that's kind of the point of our lecture today. Now. Um, I have said before in some of my later classes that the secret weapon of engineering is a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan. Um, I usually describe that from a mechanics perspective because we cut sections in order to investigate the internal forces in top, inside structures and components. But from a drawing standpoint, cutting a section can be a very powerful tool for you as a drafter to be able to qualitatively and quantitatively describe a part. It's mainly used for representing the internal features of a part that aren't visible um, from the outside. And I use the example like if you have a melon and you cut it in half, well now you see the seeds, right? Um, to give you a more um, engineering perspective that you can sink your teeth into, I have this sort of like um, axis symmetric axle type part here. And so you can see I've samurai sorted or lightsaber through the middle of it. Um, and so you can see on, the, um, on this middle image, the, sort of the engineering schematic, you can see um, the top or the front view, but you can also see the inside. Now, if you look at the front view, so the front view is drawn 100% accurately. But if you look at the front view, you just see a ton of circles and hidden lines because that's what you would see if you x-ray through it from the front. It's kind of hard to understand what all those lines are. But by cutting a section and looking at the inside, what you can see is what's going on inside is those holes are changing diameter. They're getting, they're, they're, there's, a, there's a change there. Um, and so it's kind of difficult to see from the front, but inside it's really easy to see. So you can see I've included both a front view and a section view. The way that you indicate a section view on an engineering drawing is you draw this sort of like bold line with these arrows sticking up. And so the direction of the arrows tells you the direction that you're looking. So for example, if you look in the bottom right, you can see that here's the section plane and the arrows are pointing this way. So the arrows are pointing this way. That's the way that you're looking at the part. And if you look in the middle, you can see those section lines. Like right through the middle, you can see the arrows pointing to the left. So the idea is that you're cutting it and you're looking at that left side. Does that visually kind of make sense? Everybody okay with that? So we see section views in mechanical engineering, civil engineering, we see them in all sorts of uh, drawings. And we, so we use that same conventional standard, that those arrows sort of pointing up. Okay, so far so good, any questions? Okay, pictorials. And so a pictorial is representing a part, quote unquote, in 3D, okay? Um, here is, so this is an object. Okay. Now, if you notice, I've actually represented it in quote-unquote 3D. This is still a two-dimensional representation because it's on a sheet of paper. But this is a 3D view, right? Now, whenever we draw the front, the side, the, the top, and so on and so forth, um, any one of those standard 2D views tends to eliminate one of the principal dimensions. So, for example, if we look at this object from the front, <laughs> we will eliminate the depth because we'll be looking at the width, looking at the length, we can't, or, or the height, we can't see the depth because the depth comes in and out of the page. So any standard two-dimensional view is gonna eliminate one of those dimensions. The value of a pictorial is that you can see all three, okay? Um, a pictorial is really, so first off, I think they are kind of nice, especially if you have a rather complex part or rather, you know, complex component. It's really nice to be able to just sort of like see the part in 3D so that you can kind of understand what you're fabricating from start to finish. They, um, I guess you could say they are not 100% technically necessary, but I think it's valuable to be able to understand the finished product at the end of the day. 
Now there are a number of ways that you can draw pictorials. I've got three common methods here. We have isometric, we have oblique, and we have perspective. Okay? One of these is very uncommon for engineers. Okay? Um, isometric pictorials are very common. An isometric pictorial is when essentially what you do is you take the object and you basically say the X, Y, and Z axes are all 120 degrees apart. So the idea is the X axis maybe goes this way, the Y axis goes this way, and the Z axis goes this way. The benefit of an isometric view is that you can reference all the distances along those X, Y, and Z axes to the same scale. So you can actually break out that engineering scale and actually measure distances along the stapler and it will be numerically exact as long as you understand the, the, the scaling factor. Um, most 3D CAD programs will be able to generate isometric views automatically. Another one is an oblique pictorial. An oblique pictorial is when you draw the X and Y axes like normally the way you would, so draw the Y axis up and down, draw the X axis left to right, and then for the Z axis, project it like 30 degrees off or 40 degrees off. Um, again, the benefit of an oblique pictorial is that you get that uh, scaling effect. However much a distance is along one scale, you get the same distance along the other scale. Perspective is the one that engineers don't use. Artists use it, uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with it for, um, for uh, portraying a part because you do get a really realistic view. The problem is scale. So for example, um, if you're trying to determine the dimension along a stapler, like the length of this line is different than the length of that line over there. Like you actually measure them, the lengths are different, even though that is the same length in the real world. So you lose the ability to scale on an engineering drawing if you use perspective. Honestly, also, it's hard. Perspective is hard compared to oblique uh, and, and isometric. You can do isometric pretty easily. Um, last thing I'll do is I'm going to highlight some things on some construction drawings for civil engineering and then I'll let you go. So in civil engineering, the, the, um, one of the advantages is that in mechanical you have to choose the front, you have to choose the top, choose the side, all that. You do not have to do that for civil engineering. We have a fairly standard way of expressing parts because a lot of what we do in civil engineering is reference from the earth. Okay? So we don't usually have pictorials, all we do is look at things according to their standard view. So what I mean by that is, let's say we have a bridge. Okay, so here's some plans for a bridge. We have three views which are standard. We have a plan view, we have a profile view, profile or elevation, those terms are used interchangeably, and a section view or cross section view. The plan view is basically you in the helicopter looking straight down. So what you can see is you can see along the bridge, you can see across the bridge, but you cannot see in the direction of gravity, okay? Um, that's, a, again, this is sort of the beauty of civil engineering drawings that you don't have to choose fronts and tops and all that. The earth kind of does it for you, okay? Profile views or elevation views, well, hold on, let me, let me mention this real quick. So if you ever look at a plan view drawing, you will see a scale block. You will also see a north arrow because you can look at the earth with respect to uh, the north, uh, the, with the direction north. Profile views or elevation views, a profile view would be looking at the bridge like this, standing on the shore and actually seeing the bridge. So we can see along the bridge, we can see the direction of gravity, but we cannot see across the bridge. Okay, we cannot see in and out across the bridge. Um, whenever you look at profile views, you will not see a north arrow, because north really doesn't make sense in that regard. North would be in and out of the screen. The only other thing that's worth mentioning is that it is possible to actually have two scales. Because for example, this, this highway project might be hundreds of feet long, but in terms of elevation differences, we might only see 20 feet of elevation difference. So we'll have a different vertical scale than we did do a horizontal scale so that it's easy to see. Uh, finally, the cross-section view, that's if you take a samurai sword or lightsaber through the bridge so you can see gravity and you can see across the bridge, you cannot see along the bridge. Uh, and again, no north arrow, and again, a potential for two different uh, scales. That, ladies and gentlemen, is all I have for this lecture. Any questions? Then I will see you all next week or Friday if you need help installing. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next week. And AutoCAD. Don't forget AutoCAD.